Coast FM's Celebrity Science, bringing you interviews with scientists, celebrities and special guests. Hey, good evening. Thank you very much indeed for joining me, Ben Makin, on tonight's episode of Celebrity Science here on Coast FM. Now, it's a very, very special show tonight, folks, as always, but tonight I think particularly special. We've got a couple of absolutely incredible guests for you. Some great tunes as well, as always. First up, it's the one and only The Stig. Yes, Top Gear's The Stig. Uh, Ben Collins is also uh, works as a uh, stunt driver, actually. Uh, so you might have actually seen him, but without realising it, because he was actually um, double uh, for the actor Nicolas Cage in National Treasure Book of Secrets. And, of course, of course, doubled for Daniel Craig in the Bond films Quantum of Solace. Um, actually, he drove uh, Bond's Aston Martin DBS in that, so pretty, pretty cool. I don't think many people can say that. They actually drove Bond's car. He was also on Skyfall and Spectre as well. And now, this is pretty cool, he also holds a world record for the maximum distance of driving a car on two wheels, a manoeuvre called skiing. Very, very cool guy, Ben Collins, aka The Stig. That was from 2003 to 2010 on Top Gear. Oh yes, we have The Stig. He's going to be talking a little bit about uh, some driving tips and some safety concerns. So he's actually part of this campaign backing uh, drivers, um, basically encouraging drivers to get their eyes tested. It was actually an, uh, announced recently that uh, police are going to be doing spot checks on eyesight and people could be in for fines. So best listen in to what Ben's got to say about that. Oh, sorry, what The Stig's got to say about that a bit later this evening. Now, we also have a famous TV doctor, Dr. Hilary Jones, on the show tonight. He's going to get us kicked off with a couple of cheeky tunes. Because I thought, you know what, I want to treat you. I want to treat you to a doctor's playlist tonight. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so he's the resident on screen doctor on Good Morning Britain. You must have seen his extremely handsome face on there before. So Dr. Jones will be chatting with us uh, very shortly tonight. We also, now because I wanted to kind of keep uh, the racing theme going a little bit after we had the Stig on the show, I thought, well, I'm going to attempt this tonight, ladies and gents. As you know, I kind of like to try and keep it varied uh, here on coast, so I don't know what you think about this, but I attempted a little video game interview, okay? Now hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, okay? Before you tune out, just hear me out. This interview is with Derek Littlewood. He's the um, actually the guy who made the brand new Sonic the Hedgehog game. Sonic! Yeah, come on! Of course I wanted to talk about Sonic. Did not turn down that chance. No, no. He'd made the new game Team Sonic Racing. He's going to be talking all about that brand new game out this week. Oh, it's going to be cool. Oh, so much fun tonight for you. So much fun. We also are going to get a bit more serious, actually. And delve into some uh, news, actually, from the world of clinical trials. I've got Dr. William Vant Hoff on the show tonight. He's actually recently joined the National Institute for Health Research, uh, the Clinical Research Network, in a new position as the Clinical Director for NHS Engagement. So uh, Dr. Vant Hoff will be on the show to talk a little bit about uh, news from the world of clinical trials in the NHS. So that could be interesting if you're into your medical science at all. Now, we also have Oh, now here we get really exciting because from 7 o'clock tonight, so please, if you catch just one part of tonight's show, I mean, I hope you can catch it all, but if you just catch one part, tune in at 7 because live with me in the studio, yes, that's right, this fantastic man is joining me. He's going to be sitting right next to me here. He's going to co-present the last hour with me. He's going to be chatting about his science, his work. It's Jared Wilson Agarwal. This is going to be awesome. I'm not going to try and explain too much about his science, mainly because I'll absolutely butcher it. Very complicated stuff, social network stuff. I'm not going to attempt it. I'm going to let the expert uh, talk to you all about that. So Jared is joining me from seven o'clock tonight here on Coast FM. I told you it's going to be special, folks. This is going to be a super special episode of Celebrity Science Tonight. Okay, well, I think I'm going to kick off. And, you know, as I promised, we're going to start with a playlist put together by a GP, put together by Dr. Hilary Jones, famous TV doctor, very handsome, very handsome doctor as well. He's got a couple of song requests for us, so let's just hear from him, shall we? Let's get those songs on, get you in the mood. And as always, folks, if you want to text in, if you want to get your songs on, if you want to get a shout out, oh, well, I'm your man. Just text me your name and your message to the coastline. 
And that number will be 07 441 900 600. What's that number, Ben? Oh, I'm glad you asked. It is 07 441 900 600. Now, your standard message rates will apply there, unfortunately. Sorry about that. You know, some would say it's well worth it because you get a song request or a little shout out of it. So, ah, leave it with you. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, Dr. Hillary Jones, please, please, come up with a playlist for us, will you? Just go on. I was really, really hoping to uh, get a little bit of a of a musical insight into yourself because I'd really like to give you a song request, but I just I just don't know what kind of music a GP listens to. So maybe you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it won't be Dr. Jones by Aqua. <laughs> 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 oh no, it's going to have to be that now you've said that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually quite like that song. I know it's bizarre, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. There's no shame in that. I tell you what, we'll have that. We'll have that plus some plus something else. <laughs> okay. I think my my favourite song would probably be um, "The Day Like This" by Elbow. Oh, lovely. Okay, well, I'm going to get them both on just for you. How's that? Excellent. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ben. Perfect. <laughs> Dr. Jones, you tease. A bit of aqua? Okay. <laughs> Don't have to ask me twice, mate, for that. Gonna be kicking off with our very special guest for tonight very shortly. But first, it's Dr. Hillary Jones' song choices. Who will be joining us later on the show as well. Cannons Town, Catchall, Shy Sauster. West Cornwall's Coast FM. Your local. It's time! Oh yes, it's time for the Stig. He actually, I got a chance to chat to him all about, actually there's this uh, new report out uh, talking about a lot of drivers that might actually be putting themselves uh, at risk, not only in terms of health and safety, but also of fines. Um, this is actually coming off the back of uh, the news that police are actually doing um, stop uh, checks on vision. So I was speaking to Stig about this. Obviously, obviously, people, now don't panic. We're going to get some silly questions in for the Stig because I don't know about you, but I just need to know what the Stig's favourite car is, don't you? I mean, that's something we all need to know. So we find that out as well. Find a couple of other things out. Some tips for day-to-day -day driving from the Stig as well. Oh, the Stig. I'm going to say that quite a few time, more times, actually, before the show is over tonight, ladies and gents. But anyway, it's time for The Stig. The Stig. Stig. Well, I'm Ben Collins. I used to be The Stig of Top Gear. I'm now uh, working in Hollywood doing stunts for movies. Ben, could, could I just say that it literally is every guy's dream to interview the, the one and only Stig. Or should I, say, should I say The Ben Collins, actually? That's probably better, isn't it? I like that. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds important. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, thank you very much for this. Absolutely fantastic to have you. Um, now, this is actually a, a really interesting um, press release I've got in front of me here, actually. Um, and I, I can see an awful lot of people, actually, breaking the law and risking massive fines. Uh, in the Highway Code, it says you must be able to read a vehicle number plate in good daylight from a distance of 20 metres. So it's best to check that you can actually do that, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it is the law as well. So, in fact, the police are doing spot checks on eyesight. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, I think we're all going to become aware of, of looking at other things in the car, like your mobile phone, that's illegal, you get points. Actually, if you're, if you're found not to, if your eyesight's not up to scratch, they can actually revoke your licence on the spot. So, the penalty's very severe, but, but really, I mean, it, it's more a thing about safety, because you can't see where you're going. Yes. Um, there's a good chance you can have an accident and, um, you know, risk your life or someone else's. In your professional career, of course, you know, having to do stunt driving and all this kind of thing, I mean, it goes without saying, obviously, that your vision is absolutely essential for that, surely, but I, I can kind of picture it seeing as well, just to, you know, beyond the kind of obvious safety concerns for a second as well, you probably get a huge advantage professionally as well if you can ensure that your sight is as good as it possibly can, could be. You absolutely do. And from racing, we even learn to sort of, you know, memorise these tracks or you, you, you think about what you're going to do before you do it because it just gives you so much more time um, to prepare yourself. And, and vision is exactly the same. You look at, you know, with racing, you look as far down the road as you can because then you can anticipate traffic, you can manage things before they suddenly rush up on you and then find yourself reacting and potentially making a bad last minute decision. Um, so so vision is completely essential to that. And, um, you know, the, the eyeball is, 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 is hardwired to the brain, so it enables you to, to not only see what's coming, but to anticipate, to, to imagine what's coming around the corner. Um, but to do that while you're squinting and, and struggling to, to really see where you are, um, it obviously makes that much more difficult. Yeah, I suppose, well, for, for people who um, are just starting to learn to drive, I think, you know, one of the biggest... Um, 
the biggest problems that they might have to start with is is, is their kind of reaction times to things and, and obviously that's essential on the road and and obviously you know you, you're kind of alluding to it there with it with being hardwired to the brain of course if you if you do anything that increases your reaction time then obviously that's going to put you at risk Definitely. I, I've never relied on reaction time. I think it's one wonderful, um, you know, we, we do these reaction tests for fun sure. um, with, amongst racing drivers. And, you know, <clears throat> some people are better at it than others. Mine are pretty good, but I've never, you, you, don't, you don't rely on it. It's, um, that really is the last minute. That, that, the, the only way to really manage um, speed efficiently is to look ahead. It, it's what, it, effectively, that is what slows time down, that magic um, moment where your your body's able to process information so quickly that it feels like time is slowing down and, and um, to do that you need to anticipate and to do that you need to look further ahead and you've got to have good peripheral vision um, and um, and for all those things to work you know you need a regular checkup basically so um, actually one one thing that really surprised me was that um, the vast majority of younger drivers um, aged 25 to 34 they're the ones that struggle to see most which is really quite strange you'd think that the young eyes would be you know more more effective than, than, than the older guys so yeah. um, actually it's not the case I think people just need to prioritise more So it sounds like that could be um, basically an answer to my next question because I was basically going to ask her, Ben if you had any kind of obvious uh, advice for drivers you know just in day to day driving but obviously you know I suppose that your answer there kind of gave people a lot of obvious things to think about obviously first of all make sure that you are up to date with um, your eye tests and make sure there's nothing going on there that could put you at risk and, and, and you kind of mentioning you know the most important thing is to always be looking ahead so that might be a, a takeaway tip for drivers out there today Definitely uh, there's a lot you can do practical things you know, we're, we're approaching the summer yay um, and um, you get lots of bug splats on the windscreen and you know grime that's been building up over the winter um, and it's going to sound really trite and obvious but uh, you know cleaning the windscreen inside and out um, again that really reduces glare you've got the sun visor there um, you've got sun you know sunglasses if you've, if you've got a prescription get prescription sunglasses um, and keep them with you and use the things so you can make the most of um, the greatest gift which is our which is our vision you know millions of years of evolution have produced um, the Mark 1 eyeball and it is there for your you know to, to keep you safe so um, yeah treat it with respect there is a really obvious question I'm going to have to ask isn't there I mean in all of your work so far do you have a favourite car that you've driven I mean it's the, uh, the obvious question the question that has to be asked to you so I can't let you go without asking you that <laughs> gosh what a tough question well I mean it's going to be I, I'm actually I'm dodging the question because I'm excited about next year with all the electric um, stuff that's going to come out but as of now um, my favourite is still the Porsche Carrera GT, which is unaffordable, but um, probably because it's got a Formula One engine in the in the, in the middle of it, um, the V10 Screamer that was uh, that was planted in it. So very challenging car to drive, but um, a, an absolute thing of beauty visually and uh, and to listen to. Legendary. Well, you need a legendary car for a legendary driver like yourself, don't you, Ben? So that's that's why. <laughs> I'm saving up. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I was trying to think actually if, if there's a kind of related question in vision because I mean this you, you might not stand for this one. It is a bit it is a bit daft. But in your time on Top Gear, right? Because of course you you have to deal with a ton of celebs on there. Did you at any point find a celeb who you thought, hang on, they're not really they're not really seeing this properly? I mean, any celebs that you'd like to kind of in hindsight say, mate, go and get your eyes tested before we do another lap? <laughs> well, in fact, I did actually teach a blind driver. Um, oh and, gosh. Um, Yes. It was really, it was amazing, and it, and it actually it really showed, it taught me the obvious, which was that the usual references of you know mind the tree, try and turn you know, turn left on the white line, were all completely useless. Um, but it still um, made the point of, uh, of actually the sort of the mental map that we we were able to create together, which uh, using sort of mind instructions and voice recordings, he was able to learn the, the, the track, and actually he beat six sighted celebrities. So it does, it does sort of raise the question of what they were looking at. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Billy Baxter, he was a legend. Um, he was a military, an army veteran, and uh, it was an absolute um, honour to work with him. But um, you know, he he made the case that um, that you know you can connecting your mind and um, to, to you know to your vision. Um, in his case, he was he did it all with his mind. But um, but for the rest of us, we know we've got the huge advantage of being able to see, and so it does. You know, you've got to make the most of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I don't know about this, but can I interest you at all in a little song request for the day? Because I just want to thank you for coming on the show, really. And, and a small way that I can do that is I can get any song on for you. So, I don't know. Can I interest you in that at all? Oh, wow. I'm definitely <laughs> up for that. Well, let's go for some Imagine Dragons, Radioactive, get people um, sparked up. Um, and if you'd like any more information about what we're talking about, you can go to the DBLA website, gov.co.uk. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Na, 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 West Cornwall, coast FM, coast FM.
So, in summary, the Stig says, get your eyes tested, make sure you're okay, clean your windscreen, and if you need to, wear sunglasses. Thank you very much, Ben. That was absolutely fantastic. And you know what? I've definitely ticked something off the bucket list there. I had the Stig on the show. I'm very, very happy about that. Now, anyway, what am I doing? What am I doing? I cannot pro- progress any further with the show tonight, ladies and gents, before I've played the Stig song request, can I? That would be ridiculous. <laughs> Now, as you know, I do like to keep things varied on Celebrity Science. So, as I said at the beginning of the show, I have tried my hand at a video game interview. Now, now, just listen. No, don't tune out because this is going to be awesome. It's really going to be awesome. I have the man who made, so the game designer, for the new Sonic the Hedgehog game. Sonic the Hedgehog, come on. Just say that again. Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, I really am that cool. This is what we're talking about tonight, all right? So... Oh, yes. I'm just too cool tonight, folks. I, I tell you. It's a brand new game, Sonic Team Racing. So, sort of sort of with the racing theme, because we had the Stig on. So, I thought, well, why not? Let's get it on. Let's get it on. This is Derek Littlewood, the man who designed this brand new video game. Derek, hi. Can you hear me okay there? Uh, yes, I can. Hi. Good to meet you, Ben. Oh, yeah. Lovely. No, lovely to chat to you, Derek. Thanks very much for your time today. Yeah, no worries. No, that's... Well, it... it Fantastic news! I'm very excited about the game release, and I think the you know the, the obvious thing to say first is um, just how absolutely awesome Sonic Sports Cars looking. It's looking <laughs> super sexy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could you, Derek? Just first of all, I guess, could you just kind of tell us a little bit about the game? Because I, I guess, I guess the key difference here is is there's there's what there's the word team in the title, right? Could you tell us a bit about this? Yeah, absolutely. So, Team Sonic Racing is a brand new kart racing game from Sumo Digital and Sega. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, many people have probably played, you know, some karting game or other in the past, but the real kind of unique twist in Team Sonic Racing is this team play. Um, and the really unique thing about that is that you get together in these teams of three, um, you know, you and a couple of other um, kart racers, um, facing off against other teams of three in these 12, 12 character races. And um, um, the team play allows you to kind of work together as a team, you know, to win um, all together rather than just, um, you know, rather than just kind of racing for yourself all the time. Sure. I mean, one of the things that I think is like, a really great thing about the game is, you know, if you're playing with like family and friends, particularly if they're not um, people who are, you know, the same skill level as you, I mean, you know, yeah, they sure. might be better, they might be a bit worse. And you actually, in Team Sonic Racing, you know, you can kind of correct for those differences. You can help out people who are not as good as you or people who are better than you can help you out. And it means that, you know, you can get this really kind of positive, kind of cooperative racing experience, um, which is a really kind of cool new thing that we're bringing to the genre. Yeah, I think it's such a nice idea. I think, as you say, it makes it... Um makes it so accessible I mean I, I can definitely imagine this going down so well at parties for example you know if you've got a load of people around just yeah let's have a little set let's have a little race come on guys let's do it yeah yeah <laughs> amazing the question is of course though now this is the key question Derek can you mix up the characters so can you have goodies and baddies on the same team or is that a silly question <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can um, you can Excellent. also have you know characters you can have the same character on the same team if you want you know, oh, if you amazing. want a team of three Sonic the Hedgehogs then you know that's all completely fine Oh, amazing! Uh, please tell me Metal Sonic's there as well. He's the—he's my favourite. Oh uh, yes, he is. Yep. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> amazing. Oh, this has sounded absolutely fantastic. So, I mean, out out this week. So, um, I think people should definitely check it out. And uh, is there anything that people need to know um, ahead of the re- release, Derek? I mean, I, I think it's, it's nice and simple, isn't it? I mean, it's cross-platform, so it doesn't matter what you're on. You can you can pick it up. Yeah, it's launching on PlayStation Four, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Fantastic. So people can pick it right up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do and do you uh, do you recommend any accessories, Derek? Because of course, you know, to get the true racing experience, are people going to be needing to get themselves the wheel? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want to play with a wheel, then you know that's that's all good. But I mean, no, I think I mean we tuned the game to be something that was you know most accessible for the widest range of players. So you know, sure. sit down and play with the control pads. Um, it's the way I like to play the game. Um, and yeah, you should have a, a whale of a time. Oh, nice and easy. Yeah, the, the graphics are looking very 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 sexy as well Dirk I know I said that at the beginning but they really are I, mean, I think this is going to take people by surprise because if they they kind of get used to um, the, especially I think people returning to Sonic if you're kind of used to traditional Sonic and things perhaps older players here I'm referring to they'll see this and think oh wow Sonic has Sonic's looking good guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um, I mean full credit to uh, you know the, the talented team of artists we have up at um, uh, Sumo Nottingham who've done the work on the game and our programmers who have helped to bring it to life 
Um, I mean, for people like me, because I mean, I, I grew up gaming, um, you know, mainly in the 90s, you know, remember seeing kind of Sonic the Hedgehog on the Mega Drive and things. Yes. I mean, for me and a lot of other people on the team, having this opportunity to, you know, actually work on a Sonic the Hedgehog game has just been the most kind of amazing kind of fan dream that we never yeah, expected sure. to have. So it's been a great opportunity and yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you like it. Oh, fantastic, Daryl. I can't wait to play. You know what? It seems like, um, it seems like people are just absolutely embracing the nostalgia at the moment I mean there's of course there's the Pokemon film out right now there's a Sonic film coming up as well isn't there so people yep. are just embracing it it's, it's a great time to be releasing it as well I think yeah I think I think the the nostalgia thing I mean I think the, the, the great thing that we've done with um, been able to do with Team Sonic Racing is that you've got the kind of nostalgia of seeing Sonic and Tails and Knuckles and other kind of classic Sonic characters um, but you're seeing them in a in a modern on a modern console so, you know you've got those kind of you know vivid uh, 3D graphics but um, we've also kind of introduced kind of new ideas to the gameplay so whilst it's still got that nostalgia factor it's something that's also very modern at the same time yeah nice uh, and Derek I wonder if we could just um, touch on some of the um some of the kind of mechanics that people can expect to see in the game. I mean, of course, there is the, the central, um, the central team play aspect, which sounds awesome. But I mean, is it is it kind of going to be the, the kind of a, things that people might expect from other kart games? So you know, get speed boosts and, and all things like this. Yeah, but the, I think the way that we we use those things um, varies a little bit. So, um, sure. for instance, you know, in like something like Mario Kart, you'll be used to picking up items and you know using them on your opponents. Yes. In Team Sonic Racing, you can do that, but you can also trade those items with your teammates. So, say you're at the front of the pack and you pick up a you know an item um, that you know that you don't really have much use for because you're leading the pack. You can pass it to a teammate who's struggling, you know, who's trailing the pack. Give it to them, and that will turn into a more powerful item for them to use. So. Um, I think the little things like that, you know, really kind of, um, you know, allow you to kind of have more strategic choices when you're racing, which I think is a cool thing to do. Another of the things that we've introduced is, you know, I mean, we've all been there when you're playing one of these games and you hit an item or you hit a hazard, you spin out, you know, you're there trying to get back to speed and everyone's like racing by you yeah. and it gets quite frustrating. In teams like racing, we've introduced this move called the skin boost where um, if you pass by an opponent when they're spun, uh, a teammate when they're spun out, they will get catapulted up to full speed so um, if you're ever in that situation the unique thing in Team Sonic Racing is that you can pull your teammates out of that problem and get them back into the race as quickly as possible oh, nice. so there's a number of different team things you can do like that that really kind of help you to kind of collaborate and work together with your team to ensure that um, you know you can win as a unit I mean the thing that we always said all the way through development right from the start was this idea that you have to play as a team to win as a team yeah, sure. um, and I think you know mechanics like that really help you to do that Ah, oh, sweet. Well, I can't wait. My brother Fred, he's going to have to help me out big time because that always happens on games like this. But it's fine. I, I'm looking forward to it. He's, he can be trading me all the speed boosts, and then I'll, I'll be I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, though, isn't it? You know, I mean, that thing where you're used to getting kind of hammered by a friend, yeah, yeah, or exactly. family member all the time, and suddenly in Team Sonic <laughs> Racing, you'd be working together with them so that when they win, you're winning as well. And I think that's like a really great thing to be able to do. Oh, can't wait! I can't wait to take my girlfriend down on it as well because trust me, I'm not going to go easy on it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to playing the game with my wife as well because she's really keen to play it. Um, she doesn't game nearly as much as me, but she yeah. really enjoys um, playing games. And again, it's that thing of you know, I, this is the first time where I can play a game with her where we can have a positive kind of winning experience together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to being able to do that. <laughs> so, well, Derek, thank you so much for your time today. I, I just a couple of things, and I, I, I'll let you go then. Uh, First of all, I wonder if, um, well, if there's anything that you'd like to uh, kind of reiterate or get across at this point, then you're more than welcome to. And um, finally, just uh, like to just point our listeners in, in the direction of a bit more info, you know, be that check the game out in store or online or, or wherever you think, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, the game has, um, you know, presence on, you know, online, um, you know, you can find it on social media, all those things. Um, you know, um, also, if you want to find out any more about the company that's made it, Sumo Digital, we're online and on social media as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's coming out this week and it'll be in, you know, all big game shops and all of that. So, yeah, please do check it out. Thanks, Derek. You know, what? I might have to might have to play this Sonic theme tune in, in honor of your appearance today. What do you think about that? <laughs> uh, absolutely, I'd expect nothing less. <laughs> Excellent. That's coming straight on. Well, Derek, thank you so much. Wicked game. Can't wait to play it. And um, yeah, thanks for chatting to us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, Derek. Bye now. Cheers, Darren. You're too slow. Here we go. Found a bit of a remix, though. Is it? I hope he's all right with that. Derek, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry if this destroys your work here. 
<laughs> Accept it, guys. Accept it. That was fantastic. Anyway, you know what? It's time to move on with the show. Got a few more fantastic guests. And then, as I said earlier as well, at 7 o'clock uh, this evening, Jared Wilson Agarwal, fantastic scientist, fantastic friend of mine, very, very handsome man as well. Uh, this could go on. It probably will go on, to be honest, a bit later. Anyway, he's joining me from 7 o'clock live in the studio. We're going to co-present the second half of the show together. So it's going to be very exciting. We've also got a couple of special guests before that happens. So we have uh, Dr. Hilary Jones. Now, we heard his song request at the beginning of the show. He kicked off the show tonight with his playlist because I thought... What better playlist to get than a GP's playlist? Because, you know, they know how to make you feel better, right? So, obviously, their music's going to be perfect. It's going to be just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> ah, so I did that. Oh, no, that wasn't funny at all. Sorry, moving on. We are now going to take a bit of a serious tone just for a while. So, don't worry. Stay with me. Okay, we can get through this. This is an interview with the fantastic Dr. William Vant Hoff. He's talking about clinical research and some exciting news from that world. So, here he is. Please offer him a warm welcome and stay with me straight after this. We've got Dr. Hillary. Jones and then and then it's nearly time for Jared to arrive outside the studio oh, exciting very exciting thank you for having me um, my name is Dr William Van Hoff I'm a paediatrician in London and I also work for the National Institute for Health Research in helping uh, research take part in the NHS Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, um, William. Now, this is uh, exciting news, actually, isn't it, um, for you this year, of course, because you've, you've actually seen a record number of, uh, of participants taking part in uh, clinical trials here in the UK. What, what does this mean for clinical research, William? Because this sounds like uh, great news. It is great news. And um, as you said, record numbers, indeed, over 870,000 patients have taken part in clinical research in the last year. And the first thing I wanted to say on International Clinical Trials Day when we celebrate uh, this is uh, a real thank you to all of those people who volunteered above and beyond their health condition to take extra time, perhaps uh, to gain personal benefit in their health through new treatments or uh, processes of diagnosis, but also to contribute to the knowledge and evidence that we have in the NHS to make our healthcare system better. So it's a really exciting uh, figure uh, and it reflects a growing trend in uh, our ability to support patients to take part in clinical research uh, in the country. Fantastic. So, I mean, you, you're kind of alluding to the answer here, I think, but I was, I was going to ask you, um, you know, why do you think you're seeing this um, kind of record-breaking numbers coming through? But you kind of started alluding to it there, I think, by saying that you, I guess there's increasing support for patients. That's right. And uh, what's fantastic is that uh, last year, every single hospital uh, throughout the country uh, was able to support patients to take part in at least one study and for many uh, hundreds of studies uh, in their hospital uh, available for their patients. So the ability to offer opportunities to patients is growing. And we're also seeing more studies coming on. Uh, another 2,000 studies were made available uh, last year, uh, which brought uh, lots of new opportunities for patients to consider. And in addition, the pharmaceutical industry uh, is continuing to bring more uh, treatment uh, and other types of studies to the UK for patients to take part in, uh, often in new medicines or new devices to help them. So it's a thriving time in terms of clinical research. Uh, and William, just um, just because I'm a complete beginner in this area, I'm afraid, but I just uh, wonder whether we could kind of just run through briefly, I suppose, how, how this works. Is, so is this something that would be, um, I don't know, offered to a patient through their doctor? Would they mention that there are these available trials or, or is this something that a patient would, would have to look into themselves and, and then bring this to their doctor or GP and talk about with them? You're absolutely right with both, both those ways of uh, finding out about a study. We know that lots of uh, people and patients are interested in research in their own condition and there is now a, a, a revised web, web, web page that uh, uh, is being launched today called Be Part of Research. And if you look at that, you can type in the condition you have and the area you live in and find what sort of conditions uh, uh, there are and what sort of studies there are available for those. And there are lots and lots. But equally, uh, you may just want to speak to your doctor or healthcare professional or your nurse and ask if there are any uh, opportunities for research in that condition. 
And even if they're not sure themselves, they'll be able to point you to people who can help you with that. So everybody is uh, moving to try and help improve and increase the opportunities for patients to take part. Well, thank you very much, William. And I wonder, just uh, just a final couple of questions now, and I, and I will let you go. Uh, I wonder, just uh, perhaps a bit of a silly question, so we can, of course, we can skip this uh, if you like. But I just wonder if looking to the future, I mean, I suppose you must have a lot of optimism. I mean, if this is, uh, you know, you're seeing record number of participants this year. I mean, this is a big step towards um, the NHS long-term plans, goals, isn't it? So, I mean, you must be quite optimistic looking to the future here. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um uh, as we change our healthcare systems and adapt in the 21st century, and you've mentioned the NHS uh, long-term plan for healthcare, looking at doing things differently uh, to try and improve our healthcare resources and the use of those, there's a re- this is a really good time to build research into that. And so the NHS England, who uh, run that, have uh, stressed the importance of research in their long-term plan. And in addition, it's very positive for the patients who take part and for the healthcare staff who take part in research to help patients. They also find a very positive experience. So altogether, uh, research is very positive for the staff, patients, and for hospitals. Indeed, uh, hospitals that have a lot of research in their centre tend to have better patient uh, care throughout even for those patients who are not taking part in research. So it's being recognised as a key quality mark in patient care. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, William. Um, I'll let you go, but I just want to double-check you're all happy, basically. Yeah, that's good for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, William. I'll let you go then. Thank you. Thanks. Well, it's great news because Jared has arrived the moment that we've all been waiting for. Jared, how are you doing, sir? Thank you. I'm Thank very you good, Ben. Thank you for having me on. Well, no worries. Well, you know, this has been been a bit of a long time coming, this one. I've been trying to <laughs> force you in here for a while, haven't I? And what, you've come. I'm very two, pleased. Two years or so. Yeah, something <laughs> like that, yeah. Well, I'm very pleased. And you know what? Just as a thank you, I'm going to start with this just to make you feel at ease, okay? I've got you some presents. Do you want to see? Do you <laughs> yeah, go see? on then in this mystery present bag. Oh, I'm terrified. Let's reveal what's in it. I've got quite a selection of things for you, actually. <laughs> so, first up, mate, because no... And I don't understand this, but uh, I got an underwhelming response for people wanting to win this. This is a foam sword. <laughs> uh, given to me, actually, by the, the, the filmmakers behind the Kuda would be king. So I think that's amazing. Wow, I so there's an Excalibur for you. Why would no one want that? I don't know, mate. Thank I mean, you. No, I was confused. Amazing. And that isn't all, mate. Because... Oh, Here you go, sir. Yeah. Just a bit, some coffee for you, some Cornish coffee for you. Yeah. And finally, mate, finally, mate. Here we go, mate. Some treats. So if you <laughs> want to take a break, have some pop tarts. A pop tart. That's all right. I don't remember the last time I ever had a pop tart, oh, but well. this is going to be very nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> you were about to remember, mate. So if you uh, if you want to pop off and get yourself one of those, any yeah. point, cookies mate, and cream. Know. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. <laughs> I don't mess about, mate. Anyway, I mean, so basically, what's going to happen tonight, mate? I'll explain what's going to happen. First thing you should know is I've got some comments from your loving colleagues, actually. Oh, no. Some comments and some questions have been sent in for you. Uh-huh. So we're going to reveal those at regular intervals tonight, okay? Right. <laughs> that's just to kind of make sure that you're nice and chilled out whilst we get on, okay? Just so, just so you know, that that's just, you know there's a backdrop of, backdrop of that going on. But the main point of this, obviously, is to explore your life in science so far. We're going to start. We're not going to leave anything out. We've dug deep into it. No, we haven't. We haven't really. <laughs> just thought we'd... Let's take it right from the start, mate. Talk about where you went into science and end up talking basically about what you're doing for your PhD. Fascinating stuff, and I think our listeners are going to really, really like it. I, I was going to explain myself at the beginning of the show what you do, but then I thought I'm not going to even attempt it because it's <laughs> extremely complicated. It's not like me when I just say, oh, I just um, put algae in a test tube. I reckon I can summarise mine as, as short as that, yeah. I don't. Let's hear, let's hear you try it. <laughs> <laughs> he's, give, he's not going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jared, take us away then, mate. Why do you go into science? Let's start Why there. Into science. Uh, well, I think it like I started with a, with a big interest in kind of natural history and biology, and that came from my parents actually. Um, my dad was a doctor, my mum a nurse, uh, but they both loved animals, and so we always had a lot of animals in the house: um, dogs, parrots. Uh, what else? I had 
um, a chameleon and various other reptiles and fish. And my dad used to breed seahorses. Um, cool. And that, that was pretty insane watching the male give birth to thousands of babies, of which unfortunately not many would survive, but they're quite hard to breed, but we did manage to get three or four. Yeah, so well I that's think, impressive. That's yeah, right. yeah, so I think, I think that's where the interest stemmed. Oh, fantastic. Well, I mean, I, I can I can definitely see how that would have uh, spurred you on, mate. And I tell you what, reptiles. I know I know we're, we're going to have to talk quite a lot about reptiles tonight, mate, because as you know, I've also been bitten by the reptile bug. <laughs> can I call it that? Crested gecko Zeus. He's amazing. Maybe we should talk a little bit about your own reptiles at some point. Whether your planned reptiles, because I know there's there's, <laughs> one, there's one planned, isn't there, coming up soon? Yeah, hopefully. Mm, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe we'll get onto that. So, I mean, you so you went ahead, did an undergrad. It was zoology, right? Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. fantastic. Do you have any? Do you have any kind of highlights from your undergrad that you can share with us? Any science highlights? Any bits that made you think, "Wow, that was cool." Field trips, that kind of thing, that you loved? Well, yeah, field trips for sure. I mean, uh, so I. Uh, did my degree at Exeter but down in Falmouth um, and we went on a field trip to South Africa which was pretty good um, yeah I mean we, we we did very small projects nothing too big but it kind of got you thinking in a more scientific way and actually applying that um, and there was some events that went on that were quite funny as well like uh, camping out in uh, a nature reserve and there's a troop of baboons that come straight through oh the gosh. tents and smashing them up. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, it's good. Baboons are quite terrifying, actually. I oh. witnessed some um, some in Kenya on a, a, a quite a similar yeah. field field trip to that, and I can remember thinking, these are presumably pretty strong animals. Like you wouldn't want to mess with them if you, they. Yeah, so I mean, cause I, harm. I've I've heard stories of people that I've worked with about them uh, stealing children, oh gosh. <laughs> and uh, tearing dogs apart. So yeah, they're not they're not something to. <laughs> <laughs> mess yeah, with got to be careful. Oh, we're told I don't know if this is true but we're told that they really dislike the colour red because they get aggressive with it and I don't know if this is true at all but they because they taught the guide who was with us said um, we're not even allowed to bring um, like red cameras or anything apparently they just hate that and I don't know whether it's something that happened to that particular troop or something um, but they just said no red trust me no red we wow thought, Maybe they were just trying to scare us, I don't know, just so we didn't mess around or something. They just didn't want to see you yeah. doing the toro. <laughs> yeah, tumbling off a cliff. Yeah. It wouldn't, wouldn't be very good. I mean, tons of things to ask, ask about that, but I'd really, like to, um, I'd really like to move on because I know something that you worked on for a while after that. And please, mate, correct me if I'm wrong because this is probably completely wrong, but you worked on things to do with camouflage after that, didn't you, as a research assistant, which, yeah. is, which is awesome. I think this is kind of stuff which people will... Because you even had a little game. You even had a little camouflage game. Yeah, that people there's, play, didn't you? there's several online games, and those games are still being produced now for other research. Um, but, yeah, just to rewind a little bit, so I, um, during my undergrad, I developed a bigger and bigger interest in reptiles, a particular passion for chameleons, not comedians, uh, people, it often <laughs> sounds like that, but chameleons, the, yeah. the uh, colour changing. Not that you dislike jokes, but. No, no, just, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I really like them and particularly uh, the way they change colour. And then that kind of interested me in the Century Ecology la uh, Lab. Um, run by Martin Stevens at uh, Exeter University um, and he was investigating and still is um, camouflage and there, there wasn't much research uh, that actually showed a relationship between survival of wild animals with their camouflage to the background because it's quite mm. hard to quantify sure so I managed to get myself on that project and uh, we went out to Zambia and we went in search of various ground nesting birds like night jars and plovers uh, which are really hard to find um, and then we took photos of their nests so their eggs and the actual adults and then quantified like how what what their color and pattern um, is was um, and then compared it to the background to see how much it matched and we managed to find a correlation with um, basically the, the the nests and eggs or adults that didn't match the background so well they were the ones that were more likely to be eaten by a predator Fantastic. So uh, before that point, I mean, people kind of saw camouflage as this really useful trait, but um, presumably, they, as you as you say, there wasn't actually a lot of work specifically quantifying that in, in your own words. But I mean, were people kind of just uh, researchers are kind of assuming that this is what it was doing? Uh, well, there, there was some evidence. It just hadn't been sure. shown in the wild so clearly. Right, right, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, there was some work done uh, by artists back uh, around the World War II era, um, and they would, well, in, in fact, there, there was this idea called motion dazzle, for example, and this idea that you... Um, 
uh, have some patterns on you that might disrupt the way that people interpret the speed and the trajectory at which you're moving. And this idea was applied to boats in the World War uh, II sure, to yeah. try and um, get people that are trying to shoot them down to, to miss. And it, it seemed to work, but I mean, that, that, that was the evidence for that kind of theory. Of course, yeah, I mean, I can, I can imagine actually the tons of kind of interest in, in for, you know, in the area of technology for that kind of work, actually. I can imagine you had a lot of, um, you know, people potentially interested in that in that kind of thing. Awesome area, anyway. Um, and coming back to the kind of um, reptiles, I mean, mate, you're going to have you're going to have to tell the listeners what what you've got planned at the moment. Is that something you're allowed to share? <laughs> Come on, it's awesome. Explain. Well, yeah, so <laughs> I, I used to look after a lot of comedians and do like husbandry with various reptiles. I used to work at a, a, rep, a, a reptile sanctuary um, and I took in a few water dragons and brought them back up to health. Uh, but now I've built a paludarium, which is like um, basically a vivarium, so you put things in it. Uh, but it's got water at the bottom and then a land mass on the top. Uh, and I'm hoping at some point to get a comedian in there. But uh, we'll see, because I'm still I'm like playing the long game. I'm trying to make sure that yes. the tank is full health before I put anything in there well the pictures are looking awesome so far so that's <laughs> gonna, that's going to be spectacular I think when you're finished nice nice work now you know what Jared um, just so you're not speaking for too long as I'm aware I don't want to be too mean to you today because you're very kind of come in uh, so I'm going to give you a few chances okay to play some songs play some songs and break this up uh, a little bit for you but I'm afraid there has been a suggestion for your theme tune tonight and I feel like we should start with that and then we can, you know, you can sprinkle some of your own tunes in there. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. So at this point, we'll give you a quick, give you a quick break. Um, oh, wait, I, here we go, here we go. Right, I saved this comment actually because I think it's, it's really nice. It's really nice. Um, okay, this comes with a question actually. So uh, I don't know if you want to take an audience question at this point. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Fire away. <laughs> okay. Well, this comes from a keen listener, Ben. And he really, really wants to know, because he knows you're an expert, he knows you're a big fan. He really wants to know who you think will win the Cricket World Cup this oh. year. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> England. <laughs> <laughs> that's Ben Toulson, and he knows I don't like cricket, and that's why he's asked that question. <laughs> Are you sure you don't like cricket, mate, or do you, do you love it? Oh, chance? no, I love it. I love cricket. Yeah, you know what the song's coming on, don't you? <laughs> this was also suggested. Bit of a shout out to Ben Toulson. He got in touch because he knew you were coming on the show. So he suggested this be your theme tune. I hope you're not too angry with this, mate. I mean, you've got to admit, it's a good song anyway, right? You a fan? You a fan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get a breather. We're going to be straight back in the studio after this. So don't go anywhere, peeps. We're going to carry on with Jared's story. He's not getting away just yet. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> So Jared, we are back now. We got to, we got quite far in your journey, but you know we're nowhere near finished at the moment. So we are going to have to we're going to have to carry on with this journey now. So we were talking about uh, camouflage and reptiles and loads of cool stuff, and now the time the time has come, Jared, to to move on and get onto the PhD. But is this was it was there some time between there? Have, have I missed any of the research out, or is this is this the correct is this the correct way that it goes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's kind of how it happened. Perfect, perfect. So. I guess no. I suppose this is the tough bit, right? Explaining what the PhD is about. Should we, should we test you first in a really cool <laughs> way and say you've got to you've got to explain what your PhD is all about in ten words? No, I'm, ten I'm, words. I'm I could probably joking. do it in less, but it just doesn't <laughs> sound as exciting. Jared, take it away. What's it all about? What's okay. it all about? Well, I mean, to sum it up as short as possible, I study dog ecology in relation to disease in particular zoonotic diseases okay wait you're counting <laughs> you're at nine words mate yeah, <laughs> keep going I've done, I've done the short bit and then I've moved on to the long bit <laughs> we're, going the, we're doing the abstract okay, now okay dog ecology okay two done <laughs> <laughs> sorry continue, continue you were nice to explain yeah, that yeah, so, okay, just, okay. Yeah. so it's like in relation to <laughs> diseases uh, particularly zoonotic diseases which are diseases that pass from humans to animals um, and so they're of like public health concern and a classic example of that is rabies um, and I'm not talking about dogs in the UK or much of Europe where they're kind of restrained on leads and they don't you know they're, they're completely under human control I'm talking sure. about dogs that are in Africa and rural Asia and they're, they're completely free roaming and they might be owned by someone but they aren't dependent entirely on the humans and so they're more of a health risk because they tend to interact with wild animals where they might um, get get some disease that they yeah, could sure. then potentially pass on to humans um, 
so that's kind of what my PhD is on, looking at like more specifically the dynamics of dog ecology, spatial ecology, and um, where they're going and uh, their, their their contact networks. Sure. So how often do they contact each other? And then I can model disease or diseases like rabies through the network. And then it, it, the hope is that the um, results we get from those models will help inform management decisions. Of course, yeah. I mean, and I guess the the kind of really obvious thing that will come to listeners' minds when they're listening to that is. Um, a disease like rabies and, and the diseases that you kind of deal with obviously they're completely horrendous and in trying to eradicate those presumably you have to have this good knowledge about what's going on because if you've got these reservoir I don't know if you, you call it a reservoir population but the dogs kind of maintaining that transmission I suppose you've got to know about that haven't you before you can make the kind of decisions that help to ultimately get rid of it yeah and I mean rabies is a really interesting one because well it's it's pretty much all over the world um, and canine rabies is actually completely preventable i mean we've done it in the u.s we've done it in the uk um the issue tends to be more politically uh, sure. related to do with like how much money is available access to people if they're in rural places um and also th- i mean really the risk of getting rabies is really associated with um free free-ranging dog populations um and what we've there's been studies going on for like probably close to a century and yet we still haven't been able to tackle it in some of these countries and so now people are trying to think about innovative approaches we can take and I think to do that we need to understand dog ecology in a little bit more detail particularly when it comes to like contact rates I'm not saying that's going to be the answer but it, it might help find some novel solutions to the problem. Sure and Jared, can I just say as well because I mean you're not one to blow your own trumpet but <laughs> Mate, it takes a lot of bravery to do what you do because, I mean, okay, let's let's contrast it with, with what I do. So I go to the lab and, you know, it might be a bit stressful, maybe a machine's not working, oh, you know, that might happen. You, on the other hand, you jet off to somewhere, somewhere, let, let's, let's be honest, uh, somewhere that's a bit scary compared to the lab, okay? You're out, you're out in the field dealing with rabid dogs I mean mate this takes bravery you're s- you are a proper superstar scientist I'll tell mate. you what if, if I saw a rabid dog I'd be the first one out of there <laughs> <laughs> well that's because you know more about it as well so that's my price as, as my supervisor says I do, we do have to get near the pointy end and yeah, that's sure. you got to watch and, and actually um, so, so a lot of my work um, has been conducted in, in Africa and for the PhD it's been um, Ethiopia and Chad so they are you know some yeah, big countries yeah, yeah. You, you need to be a bit careful but the people that are there are, are amazing we work in very rural communities um, and <laughs> so we are very alien and we look alien right so you've got like I mean I, I wear a cowboy hat <laughs> to protect <laughs> myself from the sun and I'm you know walking there with, like, with my shirt and everything and we look, we look very different to the local people and the dogs find that terrifying yeah so sure. I kind of developed to, to try and collar a dog I kind of developed a like kind of ninja uh, routine <laughs> where I'd get the <laughs> owner to uh, hold the dog and face it away from me and then I'd have to sneak up behind and while, while the guy's holding the dog and then slowly move around so he thought it was the owner's hands and then get the collar on and, and also these, these dogs aren't normally used to being collared so yeah of course I imagine they're not very happy yeah. when you try and do that <laughs> Well, mate, I mean, this is sounding pretty impressive, isn't it, already? I mean, so we can basically refer to you as a, a ninja who deals with rabid dogs. That's, <laughs> sure, quite, why that's not? quite impressive. <laughs> that's quite... Mate, as I'm saying, this is sounding a lot better than someone who just grows algae. In fact, you know what? I'm getting a bit irritated. We're going to have to close up. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, and, and Jared, I mean, I'm guessing one of the, ma- one of the reasons that uh, this kind of work has... Um, you know, it needs people like yourself, basically, to go ahead and do this. And uh, you said your supervisor says you've got to get close to the pointy end, right? So presumably it's going to take people like yourself to be prepared to go and, you know, do the difficult work. Go out there, see for themselves, collect the data, come back, and hopefully make a real impact. Fantastic. We, we, we hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, what are you thinking then, Jared? Are you thinking that it might be time to um, play one of your songs now? Because I know you've, you've given me a, a particular particular choice, choice, a bit of Foo Fighters. Yeah, why not? Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Do, you, do you want to give any shout-outs at the stage, you know, Jared? Uh, well, I, I know Beth Roberts is listening, who is a fellow PhD student, who is at, at the last hurdle of the PhD. So, uh, good luck, Beth. Keep up the hard work. You know what, Jared? You've just reminded me. We actually received some comments, and actually, Beth sent you a really, really nice one. Are you ready for this? <laughs> You ready for this? Well, she sits right next to me, so she's, yeah, it's going to have to be nice because. <laughs> well, I'll read it for you, and um, I'm sorry if this is embarrassing, mate, because it's quite lovey dovey, I'm afraid. Oh, no. Big fan of, of, of the help that you clearly give them. Well, 
He is my work husband, so obviously I have to love him unconditionally until the end of June, when I will be leaving him, hopefully for a better looking and more intelligent work husband. And that bit, she was clearly joking, mate. It's not true, oh, any of this. Man, that hurt. Uh, but he does. She does then go on to say that your dance moves are really pretty good as well. So <laughs> you've got a fan. Do you want to hear another comment? Actually, this is some some different. Um, his beard looks great sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. I, I don't know about the sometimes, <laughs> mate. Let's rewind that. His beard looks fantastic That's all better. the time. <laughs> so, mate, you've got some fans. You've got some fans. We'll read out a few more, maybe. But I think for now, let's get some Foo Fighters on. So uh, you can, you know, you've you've earned a little break, mate. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll let the listeners uh, enjoy this choice of yours. Nice choice as well. <laughs> Well, Jared, it's time to uh, delve back into the world of science ag again, I'm afraid. So, um, great choice, by the way, great choice. Um, just received a little text, didn't we, saying that it was a great choice. So, uh, you know. <laughs> by your mum, <laughs> who I love. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm quite upset, mum, if, if you're listening, because for some reason she felt it absolutely essential to tune in the second that she knew. Wow. Jared was... I mean, I, I, can, underst <laughs> I can understand that. I can understand the beard. that. Who, who wouldn't want to tune in, mate? But apparently your beard only looks good sometimes. But I yeah. well today's today's the day. Today it, look, it looks fabulous. And mate, can I just say, the sometimes word is completely wrong because it looks fabulous all the time. Okay. <laughs> that was just they just felt they had to put something a bit harsh in there just because it was funny. Although uh, I was reminded by a close friend who refuses to grow a beard that there was some science recently that came out to show that beards are actually um, dirtier than the dirt you get from a dog's. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm very glad you brought that up, mate, because uh, let me just look into my comments list here. Oh. That was one of the comments. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Beat so, you to it. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've preempted that one, mate. So yeah. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed, mate. I should have known this. <laughs> so, Jared, let's return to uh, the world of science. And I believe the next topic is guinea worm. Guinea worm, yeah, yeah. So, guinea worm. Oh, it's a horrible parasite. Where to start? Have you seen the film Alien? Of course you have. Who hasn't? Yeah. Sorry for anyone who hasn't seen it. Go and see it if you haven't. Yeah, so gu guinea worm is a, a horrible little worm. And uh, it starts its life stage cycle, let's say, in the water, where if someone, or, or a dog, for example, drinks the contaminated water, the, the little worms will breed in your stomach. And then the female worm will bury through. I, I'm sorry if anyone's eating their dinner right now, but I should, we should have probably given them a warning, shouldn't we? <laughs> so w the female worm, once impregnated, will then bury through the stomach lining and then uh, move to normally the leg, and it will lie dormant there for about a year, mm. grow to about a metre long. Oh and when it's gosh. ready to, re to release its eggs, it creates a blister that's so burningly painful the host will go and um, find cold water, splash. Um, the wound with water mm. and then as soon as water hits that blister <sighs> the worm comes out and releases its, its eggs and then the cycle continues this is possibly the worst organism I've ever heard about oh, it's not great is horrible, it horrible yeah thing. and it's really painful I mean, I mean it's not it's not fatal so there's some good news there it's not fatal sure um, but I mean what in the 1980s it was um, there were about three and a half million human cases um, in about 20 countries, mostly in Central Africa and bits of Asia. Um, but there's been an eradication program to try and completely get this thing out of, out of here. Yeah. And <laughs> Don't blame anybody who <laughs> decided that that was what was best to do. Just kill it yeah, now. Yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> that's mainly led by the Carter Center, which is an NGO in um, America. Sure. And since the 1980s, where there's three and a half million human cases, they've now got it down. Since 2015, there's been, um, well, sorry, in 2015, there were a handful of cases globally. About sure just over 20 and it's remained at that level ever since 2015 um, and at the end stage of any eradication program it gets really hard that's when it's the hardest because you've only got a few cases you've got to find out where they are and why they're continuing and it's very hard to do um, I think the only other human disease that's been um, completely eradicated globally is smallpox right. so if this eradication program is successful it'll be, this, it'll be history making it'll be very good um, but anyway, dogs have now been um, identified as a vector, so they can get infected by guinea worm, and there are lots of dog cases, particularly in Chad and Ethiopia, and that's kind of how I ended up working in those countries. Um, and so we are now tracking dogs to try and identify 
um, the sources of infection for them, which should be similar to humans, which could be um, either drinking contaminated water, um, but then there's also a secondary transmission route, which is fish, where fish eat the, the uh, worms, and then if we or the dogs eat the fish, they can then still be infected. Uh, so we're looking at dog spatial movements in relation to potential water bodies that might be infected, um, and also dog diet. Gosh, Jared. Uh, so let me just get this straight, mate, just for one moment. So just so I've got this right in my head. So here are the two things that Jared spends his time doing. Number one, he stealth attacks rabid dogs, okay, for the for the good of science. Number two, he works tirelessly to eradicate probably the most org evil sounding organism on the planet, mate. Are you sure you're just not a superhero, not a scientist? <laughs> have, have you thought about that? Uh, there's lots of people working on this. I cannot take <laughs> any <laughs> cape. They're, 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 yeah, there's a huge team working behind this, and uh, you should all wear capes, then, mate. Let's, yeah, let's we be should. Honest. We should all wear capes, but yeah, you know. Oh, well, fan <laughs> it's a fantastic area, and, and uh, this might be a, a tough question to um, to answer straight away on air. And we can put some, maybe we can put some of the, these links out if there are any. But any kind of um, Twitter groups or maybe even personal Twitter profiles that uh, you might you know want to share that people can kind of look into this research a bit doesn't matter if not especially not on the spot but maybe towards the end of the show we could we could think about sharing some for, for listeners if they're interested and want to find out yeah, more sure. about what you're I'd doing have to think about which yeah sure share. sure we'll do but, that I mean there's the WHO which is always worth following if you're interested in that kind of stuff and um, there's the Carter Center who are lead who are like leading the, the eradication program um, and yeah, I mean, there's always um, our group website as well. For anybody listening, we'll put them on the Facebook page for the show. That's where you can get those. So that's excellent. And um, Jared, just a, a few more questions for you. So you can't escape just yet. I'm, I'm sorry. We're doing very well here. You can nearly escape. That's very good. Although we, we did decide, actually, you're going to come in every week now, didn't we? Oh, so, yeah. Is that a yeah. thing you agreed about, to? About that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm busy next week. Oh, never. The week after and the uh, week after that? The week after yeah, well? poss possibly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, we convene at some point and uh, we'll see, we'll see what's going on. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Mate. Anyway, thank you for coming in today. Uh, and one question that I really wanted to ask you, um, Jared, for the benefit of especially perhaps any people at school at the moment, maybe doing sciences, maybe deciding what they want to do for their A-levels, things like this, maybe uh, maybe they're coming to end through the end of their A-levels, maybe thinking about uni, maybe going to uni, all of those things, all of the above. Do you have any words of encouragement for anybody who might be considering doing science or zoology? Oh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> oh. it's That wasn't very fair, was <laughs> it? I'm sorry about that. Uh, some words of encouragement. Keep at it. Yeah. <laughs> Keep at it, and you might one day doing. be a superhero scientist like yourself. Yeah, I mean, you, you never know where, where it's going to take you. Biology mm. is so broad, uh, the sciences in general uh, are so broad. Although looking back... I, I'm realizing that that physics was probably one to have gone a bit more into just because it seems to be the basis of so much even within the biology yes realms. yeah exactly although saying that I st still think biology trumps them all but oh absolutely yeah I mean it's so broad if if you're interested in that kind of thing you, you don't know where it's going to take you I, I had no idea that it was going to lead to working in Africa searching for camouflage animals and then moving on to working on dogs and disease mm. oh that's fantastic and Jared you know what all of our listeners, if you're tuned in right now, please join me in giving Jared a round of applause for coming on the show today. I really enjoyed the chat, Jared, and don't worry, got just a few more comments to share with you before we close up, and potentially, potentially a little little challenge for you as well. I, we'll see, we'll see how this goes. I tell you what, I'll explain, I'll explain the challenge whilst we're listening to a nice song. But first of all, just want to thank you, thank you very much. Now, um, Jared, uh, my memory's not very good. Where, where did you say you did a lot of your field work again? Sorry, where, where did you say? Uh, Africa. <laughs> Wasn't that just the most <laughs> seamless and smooth transition? I just quickly took a look at the playlist and was like, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, enjoy this absolute bad boy, and uh, we'll be here when it's, uh, when it's done. Can you believe it? It's pretty much time to close up tonight's show. Oh, what? Very sad about that. Just just one more hour. Yeah. Oh, all right then. All right. <laughs> well, no, it's okay. We will let you escape, mate. Now, now onto the challenge. You'd be pleased to know that this isn't. It isn't really much of a challenge, actually, because I was I was debating whether I should do this, but then I thought, no, this is far too many. He's being very nice. He's coming. He's giving his time to do this. So instead, I'm going to gift you with something. Just one last present for if tonight. This is a chili. 
No, it, <laughs> this is the thing, it isn't a chili because I knew that you wouldn't be a fan of. So my favorite game, just to explain, is the chili challenge. And it's very, very simply just involves eating very, very, very hot chilies. But mate, I couldn't do that to you. So instead, I've got you the next best thing. Are you a fan of these? <laughs> Are you a fan of Fisherman's Friends? Uh, I don't think I've had one of them since I was very young. Well, there you go, sir. So this is your your challenge is essentially that so you just pack. have to eat a just eat them, mate. Basically, <laughs> but in the next few days, and I will be checking. I'll be asking Sarah that you've eaten them all. You okay. can't tell me I've got like bad breath or something. No, man, of course not, <laughs> mate. I mean, I think these are. Hopefully, these are like um, fish breath ones, actually, just to oh, nice, yeah, yeah just to help thing. you, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Jared, thanks again for coming on the show. The only thing now that there is to do for us, actually, is just play some songs. So we're going to come up with a bit of a end of the show playlist, basically. It's going to be pretty special. Um, I know you had a couple of suggestions, so we're going to add those into the mix. If you'd like to look through this list, mate, I can, I can guarantee I'm going to interest you in at least one of these things. For example, what about this? <laughs> Bit of a fan of Ricky yes, Martin? I love Ricky Martin. Yeah, I thought you might, mate. So <laughs> maybe we'll start we'll start with that and then maybe we'll work some extra tunes in. Uh, but I just want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to my very special guest. Of course, thank you to Jared sitting next to me right now. Epic having you here, Jared. Thank you for that. Thank you also to Dr. Hilary Jones from Good Morning Britain. He's the very, very handsome, but not quite as handsome as Jared. You'd be pleased to know because nobody is actually mate to be honest um, so thank you Dr Hilary Jones for coming on the show thank you to the Stig the one and only Stig it was amazing having you on the show Ben Collins thank you to Derek Littlewood the guy who made the new Sonic the Hedgehog game and come on guys admit it that section was really really cool not as cool as Jared but still cool uh, thank you to Dr William Vance Hoff talking about what's going on in the world of uh, clinical science and mate just one final time I'm going to underline this in my little notebook multiple times. Thank you to Jared. Jared, cheers. Any uh, closing messages for you before we uh, before we hit into our little playlist, mate, at all? No, thank you for having me. It's been fun. No, well, you may. I mean, if you uh, if you want to come back, you know, you yeah. know where the door is now, don't you? And thank you for being kind to me and not making me eat chilies. Oh, that's so. okay, mate. Yeah, you see, I, I am a very very nice host I think you would think you'll find that mate honestly I know I, sh I might sound like it's going to be a bit insane when you come to the studio but admit it mate it's been quite comfortable I, I have enjoyed myself yeah it's been good <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's it from us in the studio in Coast FM for this evening going to finish as I said with a few tunes first one is the one and only Ricky Martin